Hello, I'm Roger Watson and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Nurse Education and Practice and that's published by Elsevier. Until very recently I was the Professor of Nursing at the University of Hull and I'm still working part-time as an Academic Dean at the Southwest Medical University in China. So thanks very much particularly to Professor Parveen Ali for inviting me to speak to you today on International Nurses Day. I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, in person and I can't even join you online for the question and answer sessions because I'm actually out of the country and travelling uh, on the precise days when these conferences are being held. So once again thank you very much for inviting me. What I want to talk today about is nurses leading a global health. I think I'd, if I'd been giving this talk uh, maybe in 2019 people might have thought well global health what's that uh, and to be honest uh, we're still not exactly sure what global health is it's a it's a fairly vague concept but nevertheless I think that the uh, the issue of global health has been brought into sharp focus by the events of the last two years I'm not going to talk specifically about the pandemic um, but I will obviously uh, mention it uh, as I go through because the initiatives I'm going to talk about here took place long before the pandemic. I'm going to talk about the uh, GAPFON report, uh, which was led by Sigma, which is an American-based uh, nursing organization, but it is international. I'm sure there are one or two members of Sigma listening. I'm certainly a member, and I know that Professor Parveen Ali is. Uh, it used to be known as Sigma Theta Tau, but just known as Sigma now. So the events I'm going to report here uh, took place in 2014 to 2017, but they've uh, they, they set up some initiatives that are still going on within Sigma. And Sigma really exists to promote uh, leadership within nursing and also nursing leadership. In other words, nurses leading in other areas of health, thus the issue of uh, global health. Now, global health is actually an initiative that was started by the Lancet, uh, by the current editor. The concept of global health was uh, really initiated there. It has, its, uh, it has its supporters, it has its detractors, but nevertheless it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at health. And it doesn't just mean global in the terms of international, it means global in terms of looking after uh, the health of communities, and it also is concerned with health of individuals in a global sense. In other words, a very broad uh, sweep or a very broad look at health. So I'm going to talk about the GAPFON report for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I don't want to be too long. Uh, it's not always easy to listen to virtual lectures, so I won't keep you too long. So GAPFON stands for the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing and Midwifery and uh, on the theme of bridging the gaps for health. So in a sense it was about global health but really it was about being a global advisory panel. In other words trying to find something that was across nursing in all countries, all regions of the world and across all sort of specialities and all areas of nursing including teaching, research, uh, policy, uh, leadership and to try and uh, look for some commonalities and to advise on, on that. So that's GAPFON, the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing and Midwifery. And as it says there, it was authored and convened by the Honor Society of Nursing Sigma Theta Tau International, now known as Sigma. We began the work in 2014 and we ended it and reported uh, finally uh, in Dublin uh, at the Sigma Research Conference in 2017. There's a full report available online. You can read it online or you can download the PDF. That's the URL. Of course, you don't have to make a note of that because all you have to do is go to Google and put in GAPFON and it will take you directly to the report. Now, I want to make clear that the report's quite big and it covers all the regions of the world and covers all the areas of nursing that I mentioned. So I'm not going to cover all of that. It's far too big. What I want to do is just give you some insights into it uh, and hopefully to per perhaps uh, stimulate your appetite to take more of a look at it and to find out what's happening uh, with uh, with GAPFON today. 
Once GAPFON reported, those of us, most of us, those of us on the GAPFON panel uh, stood down and the work was taken on by Sigma. So there's not a there's not a GAPFON group anymore. The, the panel was um, specifically brought together and devised to, to, to produce guidelines, essentially, but not to manage the process in the future. Uh, this is where it all began in a, a wonderful place and called Mariupol in Switzerland, just inside the Swiss border across from France. Absolutely wonderful place if you ever want to make a visit. It's essentially an old monastery town and we were uh, housed in the old uh, quarters of the monastery using that as a sort of conference centre. Uh, if anybody doesn't know me, that's, uh, that's me there. Uh, if anybody does know me, then you can confirm that it is me. And immediately to my right at the, at the back left of the picture is Anne-Marie Rafferty from King's College. Uh, she's also uh, an expert on, on global health and uh, she was the president of the Royal College of Nursing until quite recently. And at the front, in the middle with the red dress, is Hester Klopper, who was at that time uh, the world president of Sigma. And uh, to her right is Cathy Catramboni, who then took over from her as president. But it was uh, Hester Klopper uh, in the red dress. She's from South Africa. The GAPFON initiative was, was really hers. And she brought together a whole group of people. I won't go through who they all are. But these are people representing all of the regions of the world, the Far East, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe uh, and um, America, North, North America. Uh, we didn't manage to get anyone uh, representing Africa to join us on the panel or indeed in the first ish, uh, instance from the Middle East. But people did join later. And in fact, the membership of the panel did change slightly within the time it was established. I was on for the first two years. I didn't remain until 2017 to make way for other people to come on. So uh, it looks like a very uh, sort of Western centric uh, and, and white panel at the moment with a few uh, uh, representatives from Southeast Asia and the Far East there. But it did ultimately uh, represent all of the areas of the world, including uh, the Caribbean and indeed, the second meeting took place in Puerto Rico, which was a wonderful place to uh, to have a meeting. Anyway, that's enough about the social side of, of GAPFON. Basically, it was a great privilege and great fun to be involved. So uh, apologies for putting up uh, swathes of writing and then reading them out, but really I can't put it any better than, than, than it is here. So I just want to make absolutely clear uh, what we what we did and what we were there for. Uh, the purpose of GAPFON was to establish a voice and a vision for the future of nursing and midwifery that will advance global health while sim simultaneously strengthening professional roles. So clearly we wanted to make a contribution to the uh, issue of global health, but we also wanted to help in the process to strengthen the profession. And this is uh, easier, of course, said than done. There are really big differences in the way that nurses are prepared across the world. Um, we've only just got to a situation in the UK fairly recently of having all graduate entry to the profession. That's been uh, almost standard in some parts of the world, like Australia, for a very long time. But there are some parts of the world, uh, particularly in some countries in Africa, where the level of nursing education is is quite low and the profession is considered to be very lowly. Uh, that's not a reflection on the individual nurses, it's more of a reflection on the place of nursing in society. Uh, one of our members at one point uh, was a nurse who had at one point been the Minister of Health in Jordan. And uh, I, I can barely imagine that happening in the UK, uh, but we do have nurses here at the high table of various uh, government bodies and research councils and things like that. But in some, some of the less developed and, and developing countries, the ones we used to call third world countries, it's almost unheard of for that to happen. So there are, there are big disparities. So we didn't want to impose a model on anyone. And we, we wanted to find out what was happening and how best we could uh, serve this, this, this vision, as it were. 
and as you'll see uh, the process of gap fund took place by consultation so here were the gap fund processes these are the top uh, top bullet points there are, there are more but i'm not going to go into them all um, by any means i just wanted to I just wanted to um, show you what the most important uh, and, and the sort of the uh, most immediate things were that, that, that we did. Uh, first of all, identifying expert stakeholders from nursing and midwifery. I was very uh, privileged and, and quite surprised to be considered one of those. I think it was for several reasons. One was that I was the editor in chief at that time of the Journal of Advanced Nursing, which was a very uh, a leading journal. I was also chairing for a very short time the Lancet Commission on Nursing, which was taken over by Anne-Marie Rafferty. So I was considered to be someone who should be on this panel. I was also a fairly prominent member of Sigma. So then after identifying people, convening what was called a core panel of stakeholders uh, across the global regions to develop the plan, that was what we did at, at Mariupol and then later on in Puerto Rico. And then to... Uh, break the world down into seven global regional meetings in the report. I'll tell you what these regions were. But for example, there was uh, America that was broken down into two regions because it's so, so heavily populated. It's got Canada, North America and the rest of America, uh, the Caribbean and Africa, uh, South Asia uh, and so forth. And so seven global regional meetings were held. And the purpose of those was to look for the priority health and professional issues there. So it's about what the health needs are and also what the professional issues are that are needed for nursing. And to try to develop strategies to address each issue, not a strategy imposed, but a strategy uh, for each uh, strategies that could be developed in each of these areas and very much to leave people in those areas uh, to see those through. So the data were analysed and uh, they were summarised. And ultimately, we developed and disseminated a summary, which was called the Capfon Report. And all the material I'm uh, presenting today comes from the Capfon Report. So another couple of, 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 of pieces of text from the preamble to the report. Um, given the imperative for global health improvement and universal health care access, Nurses and midwives, long recognised as primary patient advocates, are the key stakeholders regarding future planning for the advancement of world health. Uh, I mean, th th this is how we see nursing. We see nursing as being absolutely key to this. Of course, there are other professions, uh, principally, of course, the medical profession. Um, but we're, um, to put it mildly, or to put it bluntly, the medical profession uh, is, is very expensive. Uh, profession. There's a great deal that we know that nurses can do and are doing, not only in our own system, but internationally. In fact, you might be surprised what we can learn from some of the developing countries about what nurses do there, for example. So we, this was a process of us learning what people did there that we didn't do in some of the more developed countries. But nurses do offer uh, a, 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 a possible solution to many of the issues that we identified in terms of health within the gap phone, uh, within the gap phone report so nurses are key in, in all of this without nurses i don't think there's any way that the global health agenda can be moved forward at all however uh, and this is the this is the issue uh, although nurses and midwives constitute at least 50 percent of the healthcare workforce that's internationally uh, they probably constitute more in some countries uh, we noted that nurses and midwives' opinions are frequently inaudible and that they often don't have a unified platform from which to speak. So there are two issues there. Nurses don't often uh, and certainly don't always get to what we would call the top table of decision making, of policy making in health organisations uh, and in government, for example. Uh, the other problem is that we do not always have a unified platform from, from which to speak. Uh, we know this in our own country. Nurses are much more uh, easily divided than united. Um, the only thing that nurses seem to be universally united on, uh, certainly in, in, in the UK, is over uh, salaries and conditions. But on anything else, it's quite difficult to unite us. That's not a, necessarily a criticism. But I do notice, for example, that the medical profession seem to be much more united on several issues. However, internationally, 
uh, that's amplified. We do have the International Council of Nurses, but um, that doesn't speak for everyone. Uh, it speaks, for example, for Taiwan, but not for China, because they're both not able to join. That's a major country that's not part of the ICN. Uh, the UK uh, hasn't been in the ICN for a long time because the RCN voted to leave it. So the, the ICN, as important as it is, uh, doesn't by any means represent all of global nursing. And Sigma, the organization which established CAPFON, is not there to represent nurses. We're there to try to steer uh, policy and leadership. Uh, we don't see ourselves as a representative organization. So there is, a, there is, a, there is an issue. And of course, uh, these things need to be addressed somehow. Uh, we weren't prescriptive about this, but these are the things that need to be addressed in all the regions of the world. We need to get nurses on the top table. Uh, we need to train nurses and to educate them specifically to be there, identify leaders who can take on uh, leadership roles, not just in global health, but in local health. And we do need to try to develop a unified approach to this. That's not a one size fits all model, but at least it's a, a unified platform of voice which uh, keeps the nursing voice, as it says there, audible rather than being inaudible. So the purpose of GAPVON, I've sort of said some of this already, but was to provide a platform for nursing and midwifery to have an inclusive voice worldwide, uh, to be a catalyst for global health partnerships and collaborations, and to help develop and influence policy and practice. Now, these are all fine words, of course, uh, and they're very easy to say. Uh, this, was the, this was really what came out of the initial meeting. This, these were the gaps that we saw and what needed to be done. Uh, but I just want to give you a little insight, some insight into what we actually did and what we actually uh, proposed. So what we did was that we rec uh, recognized, uh, identified, sorry, priorities under two headings. One was regional health priorities and the other one, as you'll see, uh, was professional priorities. So first of all, the regional health priorities, and please uh, reiterate and bear in mind, I'm not going through all of these. The report is quite large and detailed and the priorities uh, must emphasize the priorities differ in different parts of the world and we wanted that to be recognized. But just to give you a sort of flavor of the things that we, uh, that we uh, came up with from consultation, again, this was going to the regions and actually meeting with people and asking them there uh, what it was that were, the, what their priorities were. So we took the data from all the meetings and put them together. And initially uh, we did, I say we did, I, I was uh, only, involved with this for a short time um, because the membership changed. But um, what we did was we did try initially to identify what the global health priorities were across the whole world from all of the meetings. We thought it might be useful to see that and then to see how that compared and differed between the different, different countries. And probably no surprise given uh, what, the, what the global health agenda has been uh, for many years, we found that you know, non-communicable diseases and chronic diseases uh, were the number one priorities. Uh, that's largely because some of the big killers of previous years, which were essentially um, communicable diseases, had largely been uh, eradicated uh, by vaccines, but not by any means vaccines alone, by, by all sorts of things, better nutrition, better health, better sanitation. So non-communicable diseases have really taken over from communicable diseases. And not only that, non-communicable diseases include things like diabetes, cancer and heart disease. And these are diseases of affluence and longevity. And both of these things are increasing even in the poorer parts of the world. The more affluent a society is, the more it has access to the sort of foods uh, that will eventually uh, lead to diseases and of course the longer you live the more likely you are to uh, to succumb to some of those diseases so it sounds like there's a bit of a vicious circle there and indeed and indeed there is 
However, I'm just be curious to know that had we held the meeting in 2020 or 2021, if non-communicable diseases would have been at the top of the list, I got a funny feeling that a particular communicable disease may have been at the top of the list. Uh, I'm actually glad that we did this before COVID uh, and not during it and not after it, because I think maybe there'll be people listening who will completely disagree with me. That's absolutely fine. I think COVID was a blip and I think it's over. Uh, and I think it was probably um, possibly uh, exaggerated in terms of its likely impact. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's a view. But I think it would have been a shame to have the whole global health agenda driven by COVID because driving our own health policy in this country has clearly been a disaster uh, from the point of view of COVID, uh, from the what's happened to the, to the National Health Service, and we're probably not alone uh, in, in the world. So that, that's a sorry, I'm interjecting with a bit of opinion there, but I'm just, uh, you know, what I'm basically curious uh, to know that, and we'll never know had we done this now, would non-communicable diseases be at the top? However, now that you know COVID has largely passed and hopefully is on its way out. Uh, non-communicable diseases are, are still a, a major problem. Then mental health, uh, uh, including substance abuse uh, and, and violence, then communicable diseases, and something that comes up in areas of the world uh, where we don't live, uh, uh, but, but there may be people listening who come from areas of the world where disaster preparedness and response is a bigger issue. These are huge issues in, for example, uh, parts of Turkey, uh, and, and in China and, and in Japan, where they are prone to many disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, and uh, so forth. And then maternal and, and child health. So these were the global priorities, prioritised from all of the meetings. But I want to just show you how these priorities do differ uh, if you look at different regions. We also looked at specific health issues and uh, healthy ageing, inequalities, healthcare for migrants and refugees, very topical, uh, HIV, AIDS, TB, uh, emerging infections. So uh, we recognised even back then that there were infections that we probably didn't know about. We'd already had SARS in China and Hong Kong. Uh, it proved again not to be as infectious as we thought, but it was probably a little bit more deadly than COVID and those who caught it. But, uh, you know, we do recognise that, but it was fairly low down the priorities. And of course, in trying to treat infections, antimicrobial resistance. So there were other, uh, there were other priorities, which was specific health issues, uh, which were um, not general issues, which were also identified. So I just want to show a couple of regions. Uh, one is Europe, uh, our region, and uh, just uh, to show that the Priorities within Europe were identified as non-communicable diseases, not surprising given the affluence in Europe. Mental health, again, that's not a surprise. Aging, again, uh, a sort of side effect, if you like, of the success of our health care system, maternal child health, migrant refugee health care issues and communicable diseases down at the bottom. And those are an order of, of priority in, in, in Europe. I'm only going to show you one more region just for the sake of comparison, but a very different region. So if we turn to Africa, you can see that the priorities are really quite different. Their maternal and child health is the top priority and followed by communicable diseases, which still predominate in terms of importance over non-communicable diseases and then mental health. So you can see that the what the report uh, did, and I think uh, possibly quite uniquely uh, identified uh, from the nursing perspective, certainly, what the uh, health priorities were in different regions of the world. And we realised, of course, that the responses in these regions of the world uh, by nurses would have to be different. So all of the regions are shown in, uh, in, in the report. But I think those are the two most contrasting uh, by, by a long way. Then we looked uh, again at regional professional priorities, and these were th 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 this goes on for many pages in the report, and I'm only again going to give you a flavour of this. Um, we looked at the Caribbean region, uh, for example, uh, where we saw that leadership was, was a major professional issue, then work environment and practice, and then policy, including research, and finally education and the uh, curriculum. Uh, then just for the sake of comparison, 
We looked at Europe and it was presented quite differently here. Uh, Europe produced a, a sort of diagram where we put leadership at the centre with workforce practice, policy and education uh, round about it. Everyone identified more or less the same issues but gave them different priority and envisaged them in different ways. But leadership was such a clear uh, a clear priority for the profession it came up absolutely everywhere and this I, I assure you was not being imposed by Sigma at all we really listened we didn't want to impose but we found this interesting and very much in accord with the mission of Sigma and in Africa even in Africa uh, where the, you, you would think that some of the problems may be the other way around in terms of the workforce or policy or whatever but leadership again came out at the top um, but you'll notice you know also on pillars of the image of the nursing uh, profession and professionalism uh, that's that was considered in Africa to really affect the way that nursing was viewed the resources it got and the way it was allowed to operate and also the, just the sheer capacity uh, in, 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 in these countries where resources tend to be quite low so what Gapvon tried to do was to provide an overall model uh, to help guide uh, sort of our work, uh, which would be applicable to all these regions. And that's the model there, essentially. It provides a framework to support nursing and midwifery uh, globally for both health and professional issues. And in that model, uh, we've put policy, sorry, we've put leadership in the middle with policy, workforce, practice, education and research around it. So I'm not going to go through all the regions because that would take us far too long. But what we uh, were able to do in each of the regions was to recognise that leadership was, a, was the most important issue in all the regions. And to, uh, in those models to emphasise which of the other ones were, were more important, make them slightly bigger in the model, for example. So there's a very, very nice and very convenient, very quick way of looking to see using the same basic framework. Uh, what the priorities are in different areas of the world and uh, how uh, policies can be developed and leaders can be developed to to address that. Strategies for leadership. Again, this goes on for several pages. I am not going to go through them all, but we had strategies for leadership, strategies for education, research and professionalism and so forth. I'm just going to show you the leadership one. Basically, the top bullet point is, is, is the most important one. Uh, we must cultivate and position leaders in nursing at all levels. They won't arise by accident. Uh, uh, there's a, 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 we could argue all day about whether leaders are born or made. There's clearly an element of both. But what we need to do is identify the born leaders and then cultivate them to be good leaders. Uh, and people can lead, of course, at different levels in organisations. But uh, we really mean leaders here in terms of policy uh, within countries. And of course, try, you know, as a result of cultivating those people, get more people into elected government positions and uh, so forth. I'm not going to go through all the bullet points because there are uh, too many of them here. But I, I do think that the fourth one is quite important. And this is a, a role that Sigma can offer directly and is offering directly that we, we can develop and mentor the next generation of leaders. We need to, do, we need to identify who's coming after us. And that's very, very important. And another area for strategy was policy and regulation. And we need to make sure that nurses somehow participate and influence health policy and the global health agenda. That follows directly, of course, from the previous slide. And we need to try to create and implement an evidence-based policy agenda. So we need to be looking to see which policies work from a research perspective and trying to get that into the agenda, not just being swayed by the latest government uh, policies and fads, but really trying to stick to an evidence-based policy agenda and so forth. I mean, the, the, the bullet points there are all very sort of obvious uh, and follow logically from what, what we did. So those are two of the areas, but we also, had, um, we also had priorities for education and for all the different areas of nursing, like research and professionalization. They're all available in, in, in the report. So just to finish off, um, that's a, a brief overview of GAPFON and the processes and what we found. Um, our conclusion really was that improving global health will require collaboration amongst all stakeholders. 
Therefore, organisational partners will be encouraged to incorporate other health disciplines and intersectoral partners to achieve these strategies. We recognise that nursing does not work in a vacuum and doesn't work alone. We need to reach out and work with the professions around us. But we firmly believe that nursing can and should take a lead in that process. So thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, that's my email at, at NEP if anyone wants to contact me. If you want to check my own record of research, I'm, I'm there on ORCID. Uh, if you've really got nothing much to do, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter feed these days is usually less about nursing and more about personal and sometimes political issues. But nevertheless, you may want to follow me there. There's also a NEP uh, Twitter page, which is easy to find. And the bottom right is the WeChat link for people from China who might want to follow me there. So thank you very much for listening. As I say, I'm sorry that I can't uh, join you for any questions and answers. I hope that was useful, but uh, you're welcome to contact me afterwards if you have any comments or questions. So once again, thanks for the invitation and thank you very much for listening.